I kind of thought I was immune to it in a sense. I didn't think it was going to blow up to what it blew up to. And uh, I honestly thought it, yeah, it would just blow over. And it didn't. It really didn't. Let's face it, none of us are ever going to forget 2020. That was Melbourne cafe owner Ryan. He was just one of tens of thousands of Australians who spent the year trying to operate a business under some of the toughest circumstances in decades. But whether or not your own business or your own employment situation was impacted directly, nobody could ignore seeing the financial impact of COVID-19 start to unfold. Remember that footage of hundreds of masked Australians lined up at Centrelink after becoming suddenly unemployed? This might be the first real recession I really remember in my adult life. There was a 2008 global financial crisis, of course, but Australia came out of it relatively unscathed. Or is that just the wisdom of hindsight? One of my advantages is that I'm so old that this is the fourth (laughs) recession that I've worked through. Because I've been on both sides of three recessions, I don't know where the jobs will come from. Come back and see me in two or three years' time and I will look up the figures and tell you where they did come from. Because what I do know is that they do come. We've had recessions before... And we've lived to tell the tale, previous recessions. We will nonetheless live to tell the tale. Ross Gittins is the economics editor of the Sydney Morning Herald and a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. He spoke to Seriously Social in 2020, just when the economy was straining under the onset of the pandemic. And he helped us to wade through some of the financial implications of the recession brought on by COVID-19. A year on, I thought it would be really interesting to see if he was on the money, if you'll pardon the pun. To help me do that, I've got Professor Richard Holden with me. Richard is an economist from the University of New South Wales, and you'll hear him on the news quite a bit. He's also the incoming president of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. This is Seriously Social, I'm Ginger Gorman, and I've tasked Richard with helping us unpack exactly what did happen with the COVID-19 recession and where that leaves us in 2021 and beyond. So let's start with jobs. Ross Giddens told me that the sector to watch was hospitality. In the last 50 years, that's where the increases in jobs have come from. So how is the services sector faring after 14 months of COVID-19 in Australia? Anecdotally, it might seem like it's done pretty well, at least recently. Since Victoria's second wave lockdown last year, Australia has only seen the occasional case of community transmission, and the resulting lockdowns have mostly been local and short. As an economist, I like data rather than anecdotes. Look, I take Richard's point, but as a journalist, I love anecdotes. So I took my recorder into some cafes when I visited Melbourne recently, and I learned that the recovery has been a bit more complicated for cafe owners than I'd realised. Here's Ryan again. Yeah, I use the term a false economy. The the first four, five, six days of reopening was gangbusters. And it's it's kind of like people bottlenecking. It's like if you're not allowed to have something for nine months, then and then you're told you can have it, you rush out and you get it. So we were quite busy and it was it was a great vibe. It was um it was great. But uh, yeah, after the first week, you still see the same regulars, but not at the high frequency that you used to. People, A, bought coffee machines and mastered the art of cooking breakfast for themselves. And then what happened after that great fanfare, November, everyone's come back, you think it's going to go well. How's it panning out now? Uh, well, your customers kind of tell you how it's panning out for them as well. Generally comes with an apology. That, um, sorry you don't see me as often anymore. I learnt how to make coffee. Um, I can smash Avo myself now. 
side note, I always thought it was a weird thing that people couldn't smash their own avocado, <laughs> but it paid my rent, so I was happy with it. Uh, and now, yeah, people apologise for not coming as often. I'm thinking that maybe a lot of them are working from home. So, yeah, they, their routine's changed, and you'll see people for lunch... Um, I also noticed the average spend has dropped a little as well. So trying to accommodate to, um, you know, please your customers and fill your till. This is interesting on a number of levels. So people are now working from home more, but it sounds to me like they're not spending as much money because they either have it or they don't want to and they're cautious in case there's another lockdown. Yeah, absolutely. Look, everyone's got their own story and, and they'll try to tell tell it to you. It's individual. I For 20 years, I've tried to work out why February is the quietest month in Melbourne and we all have different theories on credit card statements and Christmas and whatnot. I've kind of stopped trying to predict what happens now and just let it unfold naturally. But I can. There's a massive line in the sand and breakfast during the week... Is, is over in Melbourne, sadly. So what does Richard Holden say about this? The hospitality sector is still under a great deal of pressure. Um, if you just casually look around, having said I don't like anecdotes, if you just casually look around and look at how many of your local favourite little hole-in-the-wall local restaurants, your local Thai place or maybe a local coffee shop, have suddenly, you know, shut down. I think that's sort of a signal of what the data might actually say. Um, and, you know, as I say, there are whole sectors here. So um, tourism still, you know, a really big deal. The international border is going to remain closed for a considerable period of time more. We don't even know how long more. You know, international student numbers uh, are still down materially. That cost the economy about $10 billion last year. It's likely to be more in 2021. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's significant. That's real money. And so there are a whole number of sectors that are we're waiting to see if they'll bounce back in addition to seeing what happens to those potential zombie firms. The services sector, education, tourism, these are really important parts of our economy. So where are the jobs going to come from now that we are apparently bouncing back from the worst of it? Fingers crossed. It's very hard to know what's just straight recovery and what's a trajectory for future growth. You know, the services sector is such a big part of the Australian economy that if the jobs don't come from the services sector, then they're not going to come from anywhere. Um, You know, we're not all of a sudden going to start manufacturing cars or refrigerators again. So, um, you know, there may be some possibility in certain important you know, important but sort of niche areas like medical technology or or something like that, and that would be very exciting. But that's not going to put, you know, hundreds of thousands of Australians back to work. So it's going to have to come in the services sector, and so it will come back. But we'll, we'll have to wait to see what's kind of the bounce back versus what's the growing off the new the new base and, and getting used to the new normal. Why, from an economist's point of view, is the services sector the crucial one to watch in terms of recovery? I think there's a couple of points. One is just such a big percentage of the economy and of jobs. I think the other thing is that it's a really important um, step on the ladder for a lot of young people. So it's where a lot of young people get their start. And we know from voluminous research around the world that if young people come into a bad labour market when they finish school or if they finish TAFE or if they finish university, it's really at all levels of education. If people come into a bad labour market, even if it's like a one-year recession, that has a permanent effect. This is what's known as labour market scarring. Um, And it has a permanent effect on their career trajectories and their lifetime earnings. And so if we don't see jobs coming in where young people are more likely to get jobs, then that's going to have a really big effect on them for the rest of their lives. And that's of great concern. Ross said this too last year. He pointed out that when companies have to tighten their bootstraps to avoid having to sack long-time employees, they have to stop hiring new ones. Employers fix their problem in recessions by cancelling their annual intake of people at the entry level, Uh, people just leaving school or more these days just leaving university. So you say, well, look, I don't want to have to lay off all my staff. That would be very hard on them. So what I'll do is I'll run the numbers down by natural attrition And that says when people leave, they're not replaced. But the other thing it says is 
we're certainly not going to go out and hire anybody. And that is what employers do almost automatically in every downturn. But when you think about it, the people who are most affected by that are people who are trying to enter the workforce. We felt that we got through the global financial crisis without having a recession, unlike just about all the other rich countries, which is true. But if you looked at the figures very closely, you discovered that still meant that young people leaving the education system bore the great burden of the downturn that was the global financial crisis because they took a lot longer to find jobs. That's what happens in every recession. It even happened in the GFC, which we say wasn't a recession. I don't say it, but everybody else does. And so there is just no doubt that it's the young people who bear, as a class, who bear that heaviest burden during a recession. Alicia was one young Australian who had saved hard to open a food pop-up in Melbourne. In a massive stroke of bad luck, she was only about six weeks into being open for business. She was getting great reviews and setting up supply chains when COVID hit and it all came crashing down. She had to make other plans fast. All that hard work was just down the drain and I was left with, like, no employment. And, yeah, well, I think I was in a bit of a shock at the time. I, I always think I can get back on my feet, but there was not any prospects for me to move anywhere, really. I, I had just hired probably about 10 people to work on pop-up chef. And a lot of people who were from migrant backgrounds who were kind of relying on that with their 20 hours a week of work that they were allowed to do on visas and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, once um, the pop-up was over, I had them actually messaging me being like, are you doing anything? We can't find work. We have nothing. Like, we can't... We're not We're not able to get Centrelink. We're not able to get government benefits. My parents can't send money over. Do you have anything going on? So, and I had to just write, sorry, I have nothing. I'm not even... I don't have a job at the moment. So at the end of the day, I had to almost just settle with the idea, okay, I'm moving back in my, with my parents. I'm lucky enough that it's, you know, a good situation there and we can have, you know, a comfortable bed and, like, good food and all of those kind of things and live in Canberra. Alicia's dad, John, was put in the position that so many Australians with adult children have found themselves in, opening their homes back up to their kids. I think that people just assume that this was just a you know a temporary thing and it would go away and everything would be back to normal. I had no difficulty myself, but then again, we're pretty accepting and Alicia is most of the time very easy to live with. <laughs> <laughs> but we were also used to these strange outbursts that she would have from time to time. Uh, so uh, <laughs> That would be feeling sad. <laughs> yeah, she would, but I could see why she would feel that way. It was never, I never thought it was going to be a long-term thing. Happily, Alicia had some other skills to fall back on, and she's managed to make the best of an undoubtedly devastating setback. But what about the bigger picture? Is the recession really over? Here's Richard Holden again. It's been really, really tough on young people and I'm afraid it will continue to be uh, until we make real progress with the, the vaccine rollout. And that's not just here, that's about the vaccine rollout around the world going well. And even though the US and the UK are doing well and Israel's doing well and some, some countries in Europe are really getting their act together, um, you've got to think about what happens when the Chinese vaccine doesn't seem to be working that well. Um, you know, is India going to be able to vaccinate, you know, nearly one and a half billion people? That's just a logistical challenge that's almost unprecedented in human history. And, um, you know, if the whole world isn't properly vaccinated, we're going to have real problems and they're going to fall disproportionately on young people, unfortunately. And it's also interesting thinking about the parents of all those young people trying to guide them through an experience which they have no experiences of themselves. They've got no yardstick here. These are not the kinds of things that their parents taught them. We don't know. In our lifetimes, we haven't had a pandemic. 
No, it's exactly. It's hard enough, um, you know, telling people about uh, year 10 circle geometry or something like that <laughs> and trying to remember what that was like, let alone, you know, when I, when I was your age and we had a massive global pandemic, that's not something that people have had experience of, as you say. This will be a much harder recession to get out of than than previous recessions. That's what Ross had to say last year about Australia's prospects of climbing out of recession. It's almost 30 years since our last recession. That means that most people under 50 have never consciously lived through it. They might have been, you know, 10 or 12 at the time of the last one. So they don't have an experience of that. What I know is that people hate recessions. At the moment, they hate the virus and the lockdown. But once we get on top of that, it'll be the recession that they hate because they will see that they're not getting pay rises, it's hard to get a job, they know friends who lost their jobs and are still searching for them, or they've got children who haven't been able to find a job. It's a big worry for people leaving education. And the other thing you know, and this is a sort of iron rule of all recessions, and that is getting into it is a lot easier than climbing out of it. You lose all the jobs. There's a fall in employment and an increase in unemployment that happens reasonably quickly, and then it takes years for you to get back to that level of employment that you were previously at. That's the hard part. That's the grind. But that's also the bit that the government has most ability to do something about if it uh, is of a mind to, and if it's not prepared to live with high levels of unemployment. Employment's a tricky one. At first glance, it looks a lot like Ross predicted, that it would take longer to bounce back than it actually has, but we still don't really know what the fallout from the end of JobKeeper will be. And then, how we view our current employment figures depends on what you think we should be aiming for. Back in the present day, here's Richard Holden again. Roughly speaking, we're at 5.6% unemployment and, and we were at, say, 5.2% coming into the pandemic. So sort of close in numerical terms, of course, underemployment was a big issue before um, the pandemic and it's, and it's at least as big an issue now. But it has bounced back and things like looking at the total hours worked in the economy is a pretty good way of thinking about getting at the underemployment aspect of it as well. And that has bounced back well. But it's really, you know, back to a level that was insufficient to drive upward pressure on wages. That's point one. And secondly, you know, the difference between 5.2% and 4% unemployment is really, really big. (laughs) That's a lot of that's a lot of people. We're talking about in the hundreds of thousands of people you know, not having a job, who could have a job and, um, you know, possibly more. And that's that's just got a huge both financial and economic but human toll to it. And so, you know, some people say, well, we haven't had 4% unemployment or we only sort of touched it once in kind of many people's lifetimes or if you're 45 or something, you know, it's only happened sort of for a brief moment in our lifetimes. But we know from overseas experience it wasn't until the UK got unemployment you know, under 4% that wages started rising. It wasn't until the US got unemployment down into the mid threes that wages started rising. And both Treasury and the Reserve Bank think that we need to do maybe not quite as low as the US, but we need to have unemployment down around 4% or even lower to get wages moving again. So not long after I recorded this chat with Richard, the government changed its tone on the unemployment levels. Seems like they will aim for an unemployment figure in the range of 4 to 5%. And I guess future Richard will be pleased about that. JobKeeper is one of the components to this we can't really tie up into a neat bow. It worked, kind of, for some businesses, but not for others. Ryan, the Melbourne cafe owner, told me that it made it hard to get full-time hospitality workers when they could earn $700 plus a week for working just two shifts. And what about those businesses that still haven't recovered? Without JobKeeper, will they have to lay off staff? I understand and, you know, my colleague economists understand JobKeeper can't go on forever. That had to taper away. We can debate whether it should have tapered away when it did or whether it should be extended longer. I think part of that taper was premised on a vaccine rollout that was going to go a lot better than it did. In fact, 
You know, the federal budget papers last year said that the benefit of a vaccine rollout could be as much as $34 billion a year. You know, another way to say that is that the cost of the fact that we're probably a year behind schedule is, well, by their own numbers, $34 billion a year. I I really hope that from a fiscal perspective, the government doesn't perform some kind of quasi-austerity dance and that they actually focus on growing the economy rather than balancing the budget in the first instance. If you were treasurer for the day, what measures would you be putting in place this federal budget? Well, let's start by noting what a terrifying prospect of me being treasurer for a day is. And so, <laughs> but, you know, I'll go with the hypothetical. Um, so what I'd like to see is really meaningful investment in social and physical infrastructure. Social infrastructure includes everything from better availability of childcare, making pre-K education available to, to all Australian households, making sure that we have the right kind of education and training programs and expanding that. And it's not like nothing's been done in any of these areas, but I would like to see a lot more done in all of those areas on the social infrastructure side. And then on the physical infrastructure, again, it's not that nothing's being done, but the government's been touting numbers like $100 billion, yeah, over 10 years. That's just really not a lot of money. Now, there are real issues about you know, how many people you can get to work on how many building sites and how many cranes you can put in place and how much construction can get done. Those are all real, but I think that there's been a general lack of ambition for sort of nation-building projects. And one of the things that we learnt from, you know, the last decade or so is we had really high levels of population growth, really high levels of net migration to Australia, a population growing, you know, above 1% a year. And we didn't have the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, as well as the social infrastructure to keep up with that. We paid a really big price for that in terms of congestion, in terms of housing affordability, in terms of access to services and so on. We just need to do better on that front. And I understand that it's not easy, but, you know, if government was easy, anybody could do it. And the point about competent management, and both sides of politics like to tout their credentials as good economic managers and good at getting the execution right on things, you know, let's see it. This is Seriously Social. I'm Ginger Gorman. And even if you figured out how to smash your own avo, maybe have brekkie at a cafe now and then anyway. Next time in our second bonus episode for this season, we'll check back in with Australia's tourism industry and see how we're travelling, literally and figuratively, this year. Remember, if you like what you're hearing, we'd love you to share this episode with your friends or colleagues or connect with us on our socials. You can find it all at seriouslysocial.org.au. See you next time.